doncs, han utilitzat eh, aquestes ciències per construir la seva història no? i s'ha intentat buscar el, el, o s'ha lluitat per trobar el primer europeu, el primer americà i com aquestes coses han contribuït a, la, a, a generar mm, més recerca en aquestes ciències i al revés, com s'han usat aquestes ciències per generar històries nacionals. Doncs, amb totes aquestes relacions socials, eh, polítiques, històriques, culturals que generen aquestes ciències, doncs a través d'aquesta, de tots aquests àmbits, mm, mirar la història d'aquestes ciències d'una manera més nova o diferent. I llavors aquestes, aquestes tres eh, maneres que proposem, no, a través de la cultura popular, dels mitjans de comunicació i del nacionalisme, s'abordaran en totes aquestes sis sessions que hem proposat. Doncs aquí tenim el primer ponent que presentarà l'Oliver i esperem que us sigui molt interessant i que participeu i us sentiu lliure, lliures de preguntar i contribuir amb el que vulgueu. Molt bona entrada a, a tothom. I will present now our speaker of tonight, Cornelius Holthoff, which I met for the first time about 10 years ago in Vienna at a uh, conference of zoo historians, strange species and uh, he was there as an as an archaeologist and was talking about zoo archaeology and I thought what is he on uh, zoo archaeology you know there are animals in the zoos but there's nothing you know for archaeologists to dig or uh, to, to to find um, and uh, but after uh, listening to his, his talks and then later on reading his papers I became very much convinced that this is indeed a very interesting and valuable um, kind of direction to, to take and he kind of helped me to, to open my eyes and now I go with, with different eyes even to through zoos and discover all those little monuments of, of animals and uh, the architecture. There's a lot of, of, of memory culture even going on in a zoo. So in that way I got to know uh, Cornelius who uh, zoo archaeology is one e only one of several fields of interest. I will briefly go through his, his uh, academic kind of uh, career. He studied in, in Germany, prehistory and protohistory in, in Tübingen and in, in Hamburg. He also was a year in, at the University of, of Reading in England. And then his, his PhD, he went on to, to Wales where he spent uh, several years. And then his kind of his postdoc career uh, then evolved first uh, a couple of years in, in Cambridge, UK. And then I think in 2002, he went to, to Sweden uh, for the first time, still, still as a postdoc and uh, strange things happened and uh, one postdoc or one position uh, followed after the next. He was in, I think in, in, in Göteborg and in, uh, as well in, in Stockholm and then later on at the University of Lund. And since the year 2008, if I'm not mistaken, you are at uh, what is now called, the, well, the Linnaean University at, at, at Kalmar. And well, he kind of went up the, the academic ladder, uh, uh, taking on several different positions. And since last year, he is actually uh, a professor there at, uh, at the Linnaean, at the Linnaean University. Um, it was always very interesting for me to read to read his work not only on on zoo archaeology but also on on, on different fields. Uh, one of them is, is well related to, to obviously zoo archaeology that's heritage studies, um, where there's a lot to say. And uh, I guess also connected to that is his kind of continuous uh, quest or or. Um, research agenda to ask, you know, what, what is, what is uh, archaeology in, in popular culture, right? So he has, has worked on that in different projects, has uh, a whole range of, of publications on this, this topic, asking, you know, what, is this just, you know, bad archaeology, what's shown to us, you know, in, in whatever, in, in theme parks or on television and documentaries in the cinemas, or is that actually something we should we should think about, reflect about, and wonder, you know, what, what can we actually, as in his case, archaeologists, benefit from this, this huge impact that archaeology has in our 
in our uh, popular sphere. Um, little less, um, I would just uh, like to, uh, well, cite a, a few uh, titles of his. Um, 2005 was, was a, a book uh, called From Stonehenge to, to Las Vegas, Archaeology's Popular Culture. You may note the similarity to today's uh, talk. Uh, a book I can only recommend is from 2007. Um, it's called Archaeology is a Brand. You may not uh, immediately think of an academic book when you see this, this cover. And uh, well, it is both. It is an academic book, but it's a very readable and very well done academic book. And I'll pass it around in a minute to <coughs> for you to enjoy this very well done uh, and reader friendly layout that really appeals um, in, in many ways. And in 2010, there was a search the past, find the present, the value of, of archaeology for uh, present day society. So we always have this, this question, you know, what does archaeology actually have to do with us today? And he just handed this to me uh, an hour ago. This is a, a conference report, believe it or not, places people's stories, and it's actually done as, as a comic. So um, no shortage of of original ideas in the work of, of Cornelius Holthoff, and we are all looking forward to your paper. Thank you, thank you very much for coming to Barcelona. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me, Oliver, and for the um, introduction. It's great to be here in Barcelona and Catalonia, and the um, talk which I'm going to present here is uh, thought as a um, kind of um, sequel to the book. So from Stonehenge to Las Vegas was some years ago and now we're sort of continuing on the story uh, from Las Vegas to the Bosnian pyramids. Um, how do these phenomena hang together? And I'd like to start by um, presenting to you a motto um, for this um, lecture. And that's a motto I've taken from a colleague's work, Gavin Lucas, and he wrote a few years ago this. In so far as archaeology enhances people's lives and society in general, its major impact might be said to lie in popular culture rather than any noble vision of improving self-awareness. So what I want to do in this lecture is really explore the um, full meaning of this quote. Um, in what way might Gavin, or in fact myself, mean that the major impact <coughs> of archaeology is said to lie in popular culture rather than any kind of noble uh, vision of um, improving self-awareness, which um, yeah, we're quite used to in, in historical disciplines to, to hear um, now and then. And as has been said before, it sort of builds on this work that has been, uh, that I've done in the past, um, the book you've just seen and the Astonished Las Vegas book. That's sort of the general background. And I'd like to give you an example, a starter for this um, uh, theme of archaeology and popular culture. And the best place to look is on the internet. And on the internet you find many things, among them this particular ad which um, Pepsi put out um, maybe two or three years ago or so. I'm not sure if you've seen it. I'm not even sure where it was broadcast. It's, now it's on YouTube anyway. So um, let's just look at it together. Okay, and the sound is, can we turn on the sound? Is the technician here? No, because we tested it earlier and it was working then. <laughs> is he far away? No. It's not a very long clip, it's, well, it's one minute. It's the commercial length. And, well, it doesn't work without the sound, so I'm, I'm afraid we do need, um, no, it's, no, it's not that. As always, as you test things when it's uh, needed, it um, is not quite as you expect. I don't think, um, it must be back there, the yeah. solution, right? Anybody who feels technically... Yeah. He's not there. Okay, um, he, will back, he will come back. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll, we'll keep that here, and when he comes back, um, we'll, we'll look at it um, a bit later, okay? <laughs> um, I'll make my point um, 
when we come back to it. Um, but what this is leading me is to um, understand that archaeology is, 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 uh, is two different things. One is um, the role of the archaeologist in society as an expert, that we have uh, expertise and um, knowledge to contribute and to answer um, people's questions about the past. So in, in the film, uh, the expert is being asked, how old is this artifact? And he has an, art an answer or not an answer, as the case may be, but it's the expert role of knowledge about the past. And the second level is that there's uh, on the public side, on the receiver side, there's uh, is, is this fascination for the past and for archaeology that people say, oh, you know, fantastic, you're an archaeologist. Um, and what I want to do now is to give you some examples because I realize that many, uh, I'm not sure how many, but some of you are not archaeologists and maybe not familiar with these sort of stereotypes that are out there in popular culture. So this is an ad that um, was... Um, I, uh, actually, a friend of mine sent me some, some, some years ago. And um, it's, of course, based on a Roman mosaic, as you would find them in northern Africa, for, in Tunisia, for example. Um, and yet, a certain detail is a little different, which um, you would not expect on, a, on an original um, uh, artifact. And uh, it works as an alcohol um, ad. Um, it, it, it's well enough introduced to mass culture to be able to use a Roman mosaic in, 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 in an ad um, like this. And then you get examples like this, um, little puzzles which you can buy in Scandinavia pretty much everywhere. Uh, and the image also very nicely illustrates the difference in the national identity between Sweden and Norway. Uh, it's different colors on, uh, on that occasion, otherwise it's pretty interchangeable how they use the, um, this cliche of the uh, Viking Age. Um, or another version of the fascination of the, of the Viking Age is, is this art. Um, for a particular kind of smoothie. Um, well, you see the Viking helmet with these horns. Uh, it's time for us to conquer the world again. So they're sort of tongue in cheek, making references to the archaeological past. Or slightly different um, context. Um, again, Viking age, but also older finds, prehistoric finds from Denmark um, associated with the national colors. Um, and the um, royal insignium here in, in, in the center. So there's a, a political side to it. Okay, and at this point we um, <laughs> um, will return to this. We just go back to the to, to this. Okay, so sound. <laughs> this class is one of the greatest archaeological discovery of our time. That well then call the split level branch. Marvelous. What's this, Professor? Mm -hmm. Ah, a cynical object. It is an early child of great philosophy. While others look down. What's this? Mm. Oh, this device produced excruciatingly loud noises to which they would gyrate in pain. <laughs> Professor! What is it? Okay, so there you go. And I think this is very um, well um, suited to make my point here because, as I said before, it works on these two levels. One is the, the, the digital story that you see in the film. Here's the expert who guides the tour and has got access to the technolo analysis, technology, whatever. Um, and he knows some things and doesn't know other things. It's, it's, it's this expertise he, he stands for. And then there's this other level that the whole thing, of course, is a Pepsi ad. So why would they... Um, make a reference to this sort of expert figure in a mass culture um, ad uh, today. It's because, because, because people love this whole scenario of an archaeological excavation where you get the guided tour and, and get the story about this particular site. Um, and it's, um, right, so this is the expert knowledge and public outreach on the one level where the archaeology appears in popular culture. And of course you can criticize that, that maybe the expert is portrayed in a stereotypical way rather than an appropriate way. I mean, he's a man, of course, he wears a particular kind of clothes and he has a certain sort of understanding of what archaeology should be about. It's about identification of artifacts and factual knowledge and maybe dating and that sort of thing. And to some extent, of course, that's not accurate. Um, this is not how archaeologists would describe themselves in, in, in the first instance. So you can have a discourse about that. And that already exists to some extent. 
But the second side is um, much less developed. Uh, and that's why you see archaeology as a phenomenon in popular culture, that the, the, the whole uh, clip becomes something that is interesting to, um, to, to think about, where archaeology itself becomes popular culture. That's why I'm talking about archaeology as popular culture, not in popular culture. Here, the whole clip becomes a phenomenon that is worth um, thinking about um, in a bit more detail. And the term I'm, I'm using sometimes to describe the role archaeology plays or this, uh, the appeal archaeology has is archaeo appeal. Uh, it's this particular notion of, of, of the adventurer going out in the field, making discoveries, being able to explain something, um, maybe finding a treasure of some sort. Um, all this scenario, we'll, we'll come back to that uh, later on, can be called um, archaeo appeal. Um, so well, some people have in the past focused on this sort of examples and other examples and tried to identify what is right and wrong in relation to how archaeologists see themselves. Um, you can also um, try to understand how does a clip like this, how do the people who made these sort of clips and who paid for it, um, why do they use archaeology in this way? What is their reasoning for employing these kind of stereotypes um, and this particular uh, story in, in its work? Uh, and this is the approach I want to take in, 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 in this lecture I've taken and in, in some of the publications I've, I've done. So what I want to do is look more at the past in archaeology as popular culture. Um, and this is very much about understanding these sort of clips, these examples, for what they are rather than for what they are not. And that's a crucial difference because so many people have been analyzing them in terms of what they're not. They're not academic, they're not true representations of um, academia or anything else, of science. They are something completely different. Um, and the fact that they're not academic doesn't make them worthless or, or in, in, in invaluable. It just makes them an act, which is what they're supposed to be. And they draw on particular cliches and, and patterns of storytelling in order to make their point and reach and, 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 and get across the message to the particular audience they are trying to attract. So, and how does this work and what is the role that archaeology plays in them? Um, that's sort of the, um, the underlying rationale of um, what I'm offering here uh, today. Now these examples you have already seen. Um, and this is more the, the political, there's a very serious political side and a national identity side which is attached to the past in many examples. Denmark is just one of them. Um, where you, this is just a normal postcard which you can buy in Yelling which is sort of the royal site uh, associated with the first Danish king and so on. It's an important symbolic site in Danish history but you get them from many countries. In Denmark you can also buy um, Stone Age bread. This is um, ecological Stone Age bread for 23 Danish crowns. And the only thing we can hope is that it's not authentic. <laughs> um, and again, I mean, you can critique that, well, what do I know about uh, Stone Age bread? And, and surely it doesn't have sand in it. And, you know, also, and, uh, but the point is not that. The point is, why would anybody want to buy ecological Stone Age bread in the present? You know, what is the appeal um, behind that? And this is actually quite an old picture, but now there's a whole movement for prehistoric food, you know, and, and with meat and certain kind of vegetables. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I can't give you the details on that. Uh, but this has come since the image was taken. And it's, everything has become bigger, this movement towards uh, prehistoric food. And the storyline is that we are, as human beings, adapted to Stone Age hunter and gatherer life and adapted to a particular kind of food. And if we only stick to that now, we will become healthier and better human beings because that's what nature tells us to do. Whatever, this is one way of um, making sense of the Stone Age bread. And then you get um, an image like this. And um, you know this is something very strange uh, because here you see a Viking boat which is on a carriage with wheels. Uh, some um, plastic uh, tape around it and it's being drawn by two horses and the whole thing is on, on, on Öland which is just outside Kalmar, the big island in Sweden. And who's the chief? Well, this is the, um, the head of the civil service in the whole region of Kalmar, uh, who in Sweden, Swedish is actually called Lands Höfting. He's called the county chief. It's the same word as the Viking chief, chiefdoms uh, and so on. You know, what the hell is he doing? This is only a few months ago. This was at the end of September. <laughs> Um, and they're still in the middle of that. Yeah, it's tongue in cheek, of course. You know, um, he doesn't think he's really, uh, and so on. Um, and they have found Viking Age finds in this particular occasion. They drew on that. And this was an opening ceremony for the harvest festival in the area, and so on. But still, you know, what sort of thing has he been thinking at all? Does he want to be seen in this particular tradition of the Viking cliche? I don't think he could care less. <laughs> but um, that was the story that went out in the newspapers the week after. 
and you get very commercial um, uh, context here a car ad drawing on Stonehenge uh, and the, uh, I can't remember the exact slogan but it was very much about the magic of the car that was comparable to the magic of the site. So all this is the archaeological past in popular culture and then of course just as significant is the archaeologist as a character in popular culture. Um, for example here you see uh, the archaeologist appearing in, in toys, Playmobil archaeologist uh, and you see a very famous TV archaeologist from the UK, Phil Harding, um, who had, I, don't know, I know it's been running on Discovery Channel even here, um, but I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Time Team. Uh, yeah, it's not in, 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 in the UK, it's big to an extent that you don't want to imagine it. It's like every farmer has watched it. Uh, yeah. Uh, but he's done it for how long? 15 years or something? And those who know him personally say that he's not acting. <laughs> Whatever, not to say. But he's a charismatic character who, who embodies this sort of um, archaeologist who's very down to earth and um, has a lot of competency and, and, and skills and is a bit of an adventure, an unusual person also. And the character he's looking into the eyes nearly is um, the Disney version of the archaeologist. Um, called uh, in Swedish Indiana Jones. <laughs> so that's an Indiana Jones um, parody. Uh, has different names in different countries. And not, not in all countries it, it's the Indiana Jones reference by the name. But of course the appearance is always very much like, like that. Um, and you get the legal variety, um, very similar. Uh, and then of course there is the female version of the um, archaeologist, which is just as big and in the computer game it's even bigger than Indiana Jones ever been. Uh, and uh, one should not underestimate the, the significance of Lara Croft. I mean, this is the single most important computer game of the 1990s, of all categories. Um, and it's still going um, and uh, has uh, influenced an entire generation of com computer gamers. And so many copycats have followed this sort of um, theme uh, of which Lara Croft first uh, embodied. And then there were a number of um, Hollywood movies after that and other spin offs. And of course, there are other sides to this. Um, she's very much an, an, a female version of Indiana Jones, you can say, very much an adventurer. And some people say, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's female power and embodies uh, uh, a different image of, uh, of women. And, uh, but there's also the side which comes um, through in, 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 in this image. That's another kind of uh, female version of, of Indiana Jones going in a slightly different direction than, than, than Lara Croft. And here too, it's the notion of the adventure and it's the, it's the male gaze that uh, you see very clearly portrayed here. Um, uh, and that's, that's also part of these um, cliches. And here's a third one. Um, this is um, one of the biggest German um, uh, women's magaz magazines, uh, which I no longer read, <laughs> and which I haven't ever read. But um, somebody sent me, and this is actually this is a, a fashion feature about um, colonial style fashion from the 1990s. And um, I got in touch with the photographer, so I know a bit about the story about this. Um, and the story is that here was somebody who did as a um, fashion and a colonial style and the photographer decides oh, we need to have this set on an excavation obviously what other could be more, thing could be more colonial than an excavation site uh, so he flew to Egypt and it's it's actually set on, on a real excavation in Egypt and the person in the background is an ex excavation worker on this particular project can't remember which, which name it was while the two people in the front are models um, and it was over 10 pages all featured about this particular thing um, and the slogan is, the past has future. Fashion colonial style. Not only suitable for the tropics, but even fitting into the city. And so that's in the small print. There you go. So these are the some female versions of this cliche of the archaeologist. And then, of course, you get another kind of metaphor, which is not drawing on the adventurer and field work, Diana Jones, but which is the detective, because that's the second most important cliche of the archaeologist, the archaeologist as detective. And you, here you get in History Channel, mummy forensics, uh, ancient crime scene do not cross, very clear, the reference to police work. Um, and the third um, metaphor, which has become very significant over the last few decades, since the 1980s, really, although this picture is slightly earlier, this is from the mid-1970s, when the uh, rescue movement started in the UK, and this is the classic poster which they distributed at, at that time. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read it, rescue tomorrow may be too late. So the archaeologist becomes the rescuer who 
has this sense of responsibility of saving these precious resources, which otherwise would be destroyed by the bad developers. Um, and suddenly becomes a good thing to excavate um, in order to preserve for all of us the information contained in, in, in the finds. And you see the same kind of mentality of the archaeologist as a um, responsible person who saves things from destruction. In, in this um, comic, um, which I found in, it's actually a Spanish uh, spoken, I think it's an Argentinian comic called Tumac, uh, which I found in, in a secondhand bookshop in Swedish translation. <laughs> Um, and uh, it, it's uh, fantastic, full of cliches, this whole thing. And, and it has this archaeologist, anthropologist, adventure main character. And here he, he runs out of um, in, uh, a temple and says, stop to this building machine, you know, they, um, don't destroy it. And now interesting is the reasoning. Why should he not destroy it? De destroy it? And on the second image, uh, he says, you must not destroy that um, because this was built of the Inca people for 500 years ago. And that's sort of enough, you know. This was built by the Inca 500 years ago, so obviously you must not destroy it, and I'm going to stop you from doing this. So uh, this notion that uh, precious resources and sites are being destroyed for economic reasons has been introduced into popular culture already some time ago here in, in, in this example, to an extent that this is sufficient as a reasoning uh, in, a, in a cartoon. We need to save it because it's old. There's some kind of uh, background on archaeology and the archaeological past in, in, in popular culture. And I want to focus a little bit more on, on um, give you some example on the past in theme parks. Uh, and this is a development of some of the same ideas. Um, here you see Las Vegas Caesars Palace, which is one of the big casino um, hotels. And it draws on the whole uh, uh, Roman world, um, both from the outside on, on, on the top image, um, um, you know, a Roman temple kind of design. Um, and on the inside, um, on the top right, um, you see part of the shopping arcade designed loosely uh, in terms of ancient Rome. Um, and even with an artificial sky, which you can see there. Um, and uh, then uh, one of the emperors standing there outside. Um, so this is an example for a themed environment that has, um, and um, Las Vegas of course full with, full with these sort of themed um, hotel casinos. Uh, and quite a few of them are using historical or archaeological um, storylines. Um, and that's the one which is based on ancient Rome. And then you get uh, the Luxo, which is based on ancient Egypt. Um, and well, you see this unlikely scenario of Nevada, a desert landscape, and then these gigantic uh, hotels uh, coming out of uh, nothing, more or less, along um, the Strip in Las Vegas. And the Luxor looks this way as you, as you enter it, as it's hollow, the pyramid, and you come into this fantastic scenario with trees growing inside the building and all the hotel rooms al along the walls and then the casino inside all these machines. Uh, and the rooms look like this. It's uh, fully themed um, Egyptian. Um, and you get a little museum and uh, it's um, called the treasure chamber, of course. Uh, and uh, they announced it, or they did at the time when, when I was there some years ago, um, that this is uh, the museum of Tutankhamun's grave, which is far more authentic than if you would go to the uh, museum in uh, Cairo, the Egyptian museum in Cairo. And why is that? Because in Cairo they've got uh, all the stuff is damaged, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and here it's like new. And that's because it is new. Uh, these are all uh, perfectly done uh, copy. So if you really want to see what to, how, how the grave of Tutankhamun looked like, you go to the Luxor to, to see that. Uh, and it costs an extra entrance fee to um, give people the idea, you know, it's also worth more. It's not contained in a normal casino uh, business, uh, but it is the museum, the cultural bit of the, of the site, so to speak. And then if you go to the restaurant and have your meal while you're playing on the slot machines, um, you, you'll find that it's the, all the tables are surrounded by um, this excavation site where the archaeologists have only just left for lunch, so to speak. Uh, but all the tombs are still lying there and half exposed um, mummies are lying around in between the sand and so on. So, so here you get the sense of the working archaeologists, even at the, at, the, at, the, at the Luxor. And this is the sort of stuff you can sell in the shop. Everything Egyptian, um, fully themed. So, you get a, so while the Caesar's Palace is fully focusing on, on ancient Rome, this is ancient Egypt plus the notion of the archaeologist. 
Um, and then here's a different side from the, from the UK, um, Chessington World of Adventure. And they have, um, this is a very interesting theme park. It has a bit of everything. It even has a zoo. Uh, and it has an attraction called Tomb Blaster. So all the archaeological alarm bells are already ringing. And um, you can imagine that this is a truly fantastic site. And you see, you see some of the scenery here on the image at the bottom with the big skull and sort of artificial ruin. And um, obviously, when I heard about this, I had to go. Um, tomb Blaster, that is the uh, symbol. So you get laser guns and shoot on um, uh, aims that appear as you go, uh, sit in the right uh, through this temple. Um, this is the um, uh, particular carriage you enter, um, and you see how archaeological it is. So you have all the tools with you, but, uh, and then you have the laser guns. Um, and of course, we did that um, exclusively um, with the, in, the, in the name of research. Uh, and here you see our group of um, academics um, experiencing this particular site, and uh, with uh, very success on the score line, as you can see. So here, the, uh, it's a sort of generic ruin. It's not a specific site they're reconstructing. It might be somewhere in Mesoamerica or something, but it's not specific. You see the archaeologists in action. That's the theme they are, they are drawing on. Uh, but it's called World of Adventures Tomb Blaster. And then the next step is there's another attraction which is actually named after an archaeologist. And that's, of course, in Disneyland, Indiana Jones Adventure. Uh, so it becomes even more the character of the archaeologist. And this is actually... Um, it has been, for many years, the most um, popular ride of Disneyland. This is not just uh, a ride in a big theme park. This is the place where everybody wants to go. Um, and a long queue, so you need to book in advance, and, and so on. And it is truly fantastic, I can say, yeah, from my own experience. And as you uh, queue, uh, Disney is the master of queuing systems uh, in theme parks. And as you queue there, you um, see the, some of the vehicles associated with this particular um, adventure. Um, and um, you meet uh, an Indiana Jones type character who is handing out leaflets or uh, talking to the visitors. So it's already part of the attraction. And then you come past the bench where he um, put some notices down in his, um, in his book and uh, there's this magnifying glass and some information and there are inscriptions along the path which you can read if you understand this particular script which you can find out through clues like that along the way. Here you see the queue again on the right hand side, entering eventually this ruin, which again is fairly generic, maybe Meso South American, but um, not based on a particular um, site. Um, and then you enter this, this is the uh, Jeep um, right vehicle, in which you, um, yeah, you queue for one hour and then you go seven minutes through this right and you think, oh, it was fantastic, let's do that again. <laughs> uh, so this is where you sit. Um, and as you come out, um, you um, happen to find yourself at the entrance of a shop, um, which is called, uh, you know, it's also cleverly constructed um, in, in Disney. Uh, primitive crafts, authentic artifacts directly from the jungle, you know, and you think, ah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, it says, no dealers, please. <laughs> so this is, Disney always has this irony in, in things, you know, no, we don't want to have any cheap commercialism here, you know, just... <laughs> And then inside, of course, that's precisely what this is all about. Um, so here you get an archaeology that's the main ap appeal in a mainstream, very popular uh, right attraction um, in Disneyland. So these are some examples for archaeological stories in themed environments. So what do they have in common? What, is the, what are the characteristics of the archaeological story in, in, in cases like this? And I just want to emphasize three points here. First, concerning the past. Uh, and you can say it's about unfamiliar wonders, about mysteries in one way or another. For example, <laughs> pyramids. Pyramids are always good, but there are some other temples or you know, underground places. There are varieties of that. But you're not, you can't quite figure it all out. There's something hidden. There's a sort of a story you, you, you can't quite work out at first. As you enter them, you find splendid riches. It's wealthy, it's phenomenal, it's, uh, you know, the cliche is gold, but it could be anything that is, um, you know, just absolutely sensational in different ways. And it is associated with familiar figures, um, celebrities, if you want. Um, and that may be, like here, the uh, figure of the um, Roman uh, emperor, or it may be um, the archaeologist, um, him, often himself, who is um, celebrated 
And that leads us to the uh, second kind of stories, uh, which are not so much about the past, but more about the archaeologist himself. Um, which, and again, it's, uh, I've got three main characteristics describing many of the elements, uh, many of the, 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 these um, examples. Uh, there's the fieldwork adventure site. Uh, you, so you're in a location far away from civilization and you need special clothes for that. And, um, and then there's the aspect of the discovery, the treasure you find and the sense of awe you gain. You know, um, typical, the maybe most memorable phrase is Howard Carter opening the grave of Tutankhamun. What did you find? Wonderful things. You know, wonderful things. That's what the archaeologist finds. And if it's not gold, then uh, it's something else, which is wonderful in a different way. Uh, and this is still very much with us in, in so many stories of archaeology, told both by journalists and by archaeologists themselves. And so often now you, you don't say, um, I found gold, because often enough you haven't. But you say, you know, this may not look like much to you, but for me as an expert, you know, on the basis of this particular cone of sand, I can reconstruct an entire civilization of this particular place here. And this is, this is the story which, which journalists like, and, and which works in popular culture. And then last, uh, there are surprising implications of what you find. And they may be implications of the, find, uh, of the kind that I um, read that here, that uh, the, the curse of the mummy, uh, a, a metaphorical reference that you unleash certain powers that you can't control. Uh, and sometimes it's implication on a, on a knowledge side that you learn something you would not have imagined earlier. Uh, and there are stories about if you only look at ancient climate change and follow the, the, the environmental history, then you suddenly see that we cannot continue like this and it's all doom in front of us unless we change. And there are some archaeologists who work along those lines, for example, and, and, and related issues. Where again, it's a similar sort of major impact of the results of, of your work. So this is... Um, the, well, in a way, the status quo, the theme park, themes, stereotypes associated with archaeology and popular culture so often. And I want to give you um, a second side to that. And that starts with this particular guy. And uh, Semios Manarcic, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with um, who this is. Um, but as you can see, he's a major archaeologist. Um, and Semios Manarcic is the discoverer of the Bosnian pyramids. And, and this is a story that uh, went around the world about in the mid, early mid 2000s, so by now six, seven years ago or so. Uh, I know that it hasn't been equally big in all parts of the world. I'm not sure about Spain, actually. Is this something that was big here? Maybe not, but it was on CNN, all the American channels. It was in the UK, it was uh, an, throughout Europe to some extent. Um, and uh, let me tell you a little bit about what, what this is about. Um, Semios Manajic is a businessman from Bosnia who made it big in Houston, Texas as, an, as a businessman. Um, has millions. Um, and he's always been like uh, so many people, he's interested in the past. And he's been exploring places in Mesoamerica and been studying Maya temples in his own way because he had the money, he didn't need to ask anybody, he has no degrees in, in this field. Um, and he um, had this, I was very much inspired by some of the, what is known as alternative archaeology. There's a, a fair bit of literature that um, many of these sites in Mesoamerica, as elsewhere, are in fact older than they are normally acknowledged and that the establishment in academia holds back with certain truths in order to hide the uh, insight that we don't like to hear, that maybe these sites were built by extraterrestrials far earlier than we ever thought. And there is, uh, whoops, there, is, uh, there are similarities to the work of Erich von Däniken, um, for example, uh, and others, a number of people who are writing in this genre. And also Däniken has f focused on the pyramids, of course, to, to some extent, among other sites. And so Semios Manarcic claims that uh, in Bosnia there, is, uh, there are a number of pyramids, and on the image you see, you see the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun. Why is it called the Pyramid of the Sun? Well, you know, <laughs> other pyramids in other countries are called pyramids, why not here? You know, you have to call it something. You know, let's call it Pyramid of the Sun. And he reckons that they are 12,000 years um, before Christ, 14,000 years old. There's some finds in the area going uh, well before that, 30, 40,000 years. Um, and 
Uh, that makes these, param uh, these pyramids not only the biggest, uh, the, the, the oldest pyramids in the world, but also the biggest ones, uh, of course. In Bosnia, a place where nobody has ever uh, figured there would be any ancient civilization of this kind, and not, not to speak, you know, you can see the dimensions. People have been living around there, you know, throughout history, and have never noticed, of course, that there was a pyramid next to them. And yeah, it is, has grown over a little bit, you know. Um, on the right, you see his reconstruction of what this could have looked like um, 12,000 years before Christ, uh, where all the stone is exposed. Um, and um, yeah. So what has he been discovering? Here's, um, I should say, the, 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 um, the images, they are from him himself, because he gave a talk at my university about a year ago. Um, and I was very pleased that I could uh, invite him to our university to present his ideas and we could have this discussion. And I can say that not all my colleagues were equally pleased with the fact that he got this um, podium, uh, this possibility to um, talk. But um, nothing particularly extraordinary happened except that he presented his talk and was happy to share it with us and um, said, yeah, we can of course talk about his ideas in, in, in other contexts. He's only too, too happy with that. He's on lecture tours all the time. Uh, just. He has his own money and travels from one Bosnian society to the next and various historical associations. It's amazing how many, um, how many historical alternative, or alternative archaeological societies, people with interest in these things, there are in, in Europe. They don't need to go to the few universities that they are. They have something in every small village. Um, and he's one of them who's on, on the circuit throughout the winter and he's digging throughout the summer. So this is the site and you see uh, on the, um, in the center right the Bosnian Pyramid of the Sun and a bit further up the Bosnian Pyramid of Love and uh, there's also where's it on the top left the Bosnian Pyramid of the Moon and a number of other structures. Um, so it's a rich, very rich prehistoric landscape that has been missed for so long. Um, and here's some of his analysis. Um, and now we're talking about wonder and mystery. You know, this is part of the uh, uh, cliche of, of the theme of archaeology in popular culture. What kind of wonders and mysteries does he find? Well, he finds sacred ge uh, geometry. Like uh, if you, on a map, if you connect all these different places and some other significant bridges and churches, and, and, and then you get patterns. This is a technique people are using a lot in, in, in this with megalithic tombs or with historic sites or ley lines in the UK and there are varieties of that. Um, and this is his um, take um, on that. And you get um, uh, illustrations that uh, show the electromagnetic fields that uh, emanate from this uh, pyramid, as you can see it clearly here. And um, now this is not a measurement, this is an uh, illustration of the power that um, is contained in the pyramid and that connects so this beam straight into the to the air. This is not a photograph. I think even he would admit that it symbolizes something rather than that it's actually proof that this exists, this particular beam. And this is how he works. He's been opening trenches around the site and since it's not a recognized archaeological site, he hasn't had any difficulties with permits. <laughs> Uh, except on the top where you have a historic fort, not particularly significant, but there are some known historic sites on, on the top and he hasn't been digging there. So it's what some critics have said that he's been destroying archaeological sites, that's um, um, at least from this evidence it's uh, not clear um, how this happened. Certainly in those finds where he has excavated he has not found a single archaeological artifact. Uh, but he's found many other things and, and um, a lot of geology one might say. Uh, but he interprets that as uh, evidence of um, built structures uh, of this stone of which the, the pyramid um, was made. And here you see um, the technique. So um, I, I don't know if any of you has been on, uh, I know some of you have been on archaeological excavations, you know, this is not what it looks like. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of enthusiasts who really uh, think this is the best thing that has ever happened for Bosnia. And the people are from, from around the world. He, uh, makes it possible for volunteers to arrive and they come in, in huge numbers every summer and uh, help them digging holes in the mountain. Um, so this is what they do. And here we get the sense of fieldwork and discovery. They're all impersonating little Indiana Joneses, who against the odds are finding the biggest artifact on the, on the planet, basically, which the establishment being against them completely. So fantastic narrative. And all I need to do is just remove the grass and that is a pyramid in, in, in Bosnia. Some of the finds, um, just to illustrate what, what this looks like, on the left hand side you see so this, the building stones of the pyramid uh, exposed in the technique you've, you've just seen at, in the, at the bottom, uh, different section. It's difficult from the image 
to tell exactly what this might have been. Those who have been there say it's all geology. geology. Um, and some people say uh, they're not entirely sure. And these are the ones he quotes. <laughs> Uh, Professor Sonsa from the University of this and that came here and said he wasn't quite too sure what this stone was. <laughs> and this is evidence that it could be an old pyramid and even he thinks it might be possible. And a number of senior well-known people are quoted in this way. Um, and there's also um, there's one student from um, Oxford University who took part in this um, summer camp one year. And Semios Manaji is very clever, he's, he's straight smart, so he recognized potential in that and uh, he asked the students so what do you think about it and he said the students said oh I think it's great it's fantastic it's interesting <laughs> and so he cites on his web page um, name uh, Oxford University he says this is very interesting <laughs> like more or less like that and of course that helps him to get uh, legitimacy uh, in this and in a way you know I don't want to make fun of him for not being an academic archaeologist I just want to make clear uh, the way he uses in order to establish legitimacy in, in, in the field in, in which he is, which is not the field of academic archaeology, even though he goes out and says, yes, it is, because he, wa he wants to give this lecture to as many uh, uh, academics as possible, and he doesn't want that we say it's all great and fantastic what he does. He wants to enter this discourse of academic archaeology, the critical discourse. He wants to have us ask questions and then have the answers to them. And he does do a lot of studies, and it's impossible for anybody to go into the detail whether this particular sample comes from here or there, or nobody can do this in an, in an interview, in, an, in, an, in, a, in a lecture like that. And so he wants to enter this debate being taken seriously as yet another academic theory. And on the right, you see two other examples, uh, results of his work. On, on the top, a glimpse of this elaborate tunnel system which, which he found uh, going into these mountains, and he interprets as being part of the design. Uh, and at the bottom is one of the most intriguing um, artifacts which he interprets as a ceramic sculpture about 30,000 years old. Now the date may very well be accurate um, because this is old geological material and it is uh, an area where you do get uh, water channels running through the mountain and this is uh, well, it's a big block of clay. Um, whether it's a sculpture is a completely different question but um, nobody has ever associated um, structures like that with human-made artifacts before. And he also finds, of course, uh, the oldest writing in uh, Europe. He sees some examples of the kind of um, system. Uh, it's a whole block full of uh, symbols like that. Um, some people say it wasn't there when they first entered the uh, tunnel. Uh, other people say it was always there from the start and they just didn't see it at the beginning. Um, who is to say? And uh, again, this is one of the artifacts, which is um, uh, a sculpture, a face, obviously, of uh, maybe some religious artifact. Um, who knows? And other people say it's geology, just a funny kind of combination of different materials. This is what he's dealing with. And now, of course, the story we should be asking is, uh, the question we should be asking is, why does the past matter in, in, in popular culture? You know, what is the significance of all this? And if you want to summarize it briefly, you would say, well, because it tells fantastic stories. This is a fantastic story. Bosnia, pyramids out of nowhere. The oldest, the biggest, you know. Here comes this guy who uh, has this idea and makes it happen in Bosnia. What's the role of archaeology in that? Um, and I'm talking archaeology at large, which includes other people, non-academics, in this project. Well, it facilitates such stories. It makes it happen that you can, because without the field work, there is no um, story um, like that. And for those of you who are archaeologists, if you mention on an airplane um, that you're an archaeologist to your neighbor too early on the flight, then, then that is it. <laughs> uh, and then it will go on, you know, so where have you been digging then? You know, what, what was the best find you've ever made? Did you ever find a skeleton? And so on. And, it's, and so many archaeologists take this literally and they think, oh, you know, somebody is interested in my work and uh, great, so let's tell. Now I'm not actually dealing with this and I'm really doing <coughs> cemetery, bronze age and this particular. And, and really, what, what I think the key is that what this person, whoever that is, really wants to tell you is not uh, where you're digging. The question is, please tell me a story. Because obviously, if you're an archaeologist, that's what you do. Um, and that's often misunderstood. So really, you should, and um, if that happens, you really you should start, oh, you know, a few years ago when I was in Egypt, you know, and, <laughs> and you just go on. And that's, that's what they want, I think. Um, <coughs> So if archaeology facilitates, can facilitate uh, such um, stories, um, what 
best approach um, toward that. And I want to use a quote here from Neil Asherson, a famous uh, journalist in, in the UK. And he said this um, some years back. He said that archaeologists need to ask their audiences not, how can I best persuade you about the merits of my project or discipline? But instead they should be asking, what does what I'm doing mean to you? I think that's an important switch of perspective um, because so many archaeologists um, try to persuade the audience of the merits of the discipline. They say, okay, you may think I'm Indiana Jones, but I'm not really. And I'm more than willing to tell you about the detailed chronology of the late Iron Age in this cemetery, if you can. Uh, and you try to get the interest um, in that way. But really, this is not a good um, approach of getting the uh, attention uh, and the interest uh, of an audience. It's better to start by asking, what does what I'm doing mean to you? Uh, because then you understand where they're coming from and what, what, what they're really expecting um, from you. And of course, what is it? Um, they are. Um, what does it mean to you, what you're doing as an archaeologist? Well, it's a number of stereotypes and, and, and cliches, like, like those two, and like the, the ones we've been talking about um, before. So does that mean, then, that I'm um, really advocating here that we should be using the same stereotypes as, as in the media, um, that just to get the attention? Um, where's this getting us? What is it that um, Asherson, really, in this case, in the quote, um, is really after? And I suggest that this is, of course, more than just getting attention of audiences, large audiences and journalists and mainstream popular culture, uh, although you do reach them in that way um, as well. And let me um, make this point um, in relation to the Bosnian Pyramid, because there's um, a PhD student in Cambridge, Tera Pruit. She completed her PhD about two or three years ago on... Um, Actually, was she in archaeology? She, I think she has a philosophy of science aspect in that. Maybe some, she's interested in those questions. So she looked at the Bosnian pyramids as one case study, one of two, I think, in, in, in the thesis. Uh, and she claimed, as one of her results, that the Bosnian pyramids have become important economic and social assets that attract tourists to a poor region of Europe so that they might actually be worth more to society than the heritage officially acknowledged by the country's own archaeologists. So she's saying that, you know, no matter whether it exists or not, this is actually more valuable than the real archaeology, you know. I can tell you, if it wasn't for the Bosnian pyramids, you know, you would probably never have heard anything about Bosnian archaeology in this room. <laughs> and I don't think I would know anything at all about Bosnian archaeology. And from what I've read and understood is that uh, it's a country where they have not invested <coughs> a l large amount of resources into archaeological research. They've got like two full-time archaeologists in the country, destroyed museums, very poor conditions, no resources. Uh, and these archaeologists, they do what they can, obviously. Uh, but here comes this businessman who uh, creates pyramids for the country. You know, it's on a different scale. Um, and the point here is that the economic and social assets of these invented paths, which you might call them, are much more significant than any real archaeology could ever be. Um, and that is a very significant point to make and, and interesting. And this is one of two points I want to make in relation to this question, what's the point of being popular? Now here the point is economic and social assets um, for this area. And the same thought is illustrated by a quote which comes also from Tara, which she cites in her work. And this is a local resident from Visoko, which is the village just outside the, the, the pyramid. And the local resident says this, if they don't find the pyramid, we're going to make it during the night but we're not even thinking about that. There are pyramids and there will be pyramids. There have to be pyramids because our whole future of this particular village in the middle of nowhere in Bosnia depends on it. And I've built hotels and restaurants and sell souvenirs. You know, it means a lot. It means employment for the people who live there. And uh, they have, I haven't seen the latest figures, but the first few years they have attracted in the hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, of visitors. And this was on CNN. You know, it, um, and then I know one of the technicians in, in Kalmar, where I work, um, who was dealing with the technology, uh, he's from Bosnia. And when Osman Adjic was, was there, he, didn't, he couldn't make it for the talk, but he came afterwards, you know. So what did he say? It was for real? It was the big, the big, and now it will. 
So that was a California, Disneyland, well, that is a, is, a, is, is a richer and longer history than, than Nevada, maybe, but is, can that match the imagery of Disneyland with uh, you know, the whole world being represented in one way or another? Don't know how many hundreds of thousands of visitors they, they draw in up to capacity on, on, on so many days for so many years. Um, it's a question, um, you know, you, you may not want to answer that question in each case because perhaps these sort of cliches do have a bigger impact than the real archaeology ever could have. Um, and from this follow, two bigger questions, which is the one, um, and I realize it's eight o'clock, but it's, uh, it's not that much left. Um, there are two bigger questions which I want to address briefly here. At um, and one is, if this is so, that there is the possibility that some of the Im imagined past might have a bigger um, impact and more benefits for society than the real past and real archaeology, then the question is, should archaeology also be telling this sort of story? Should we try to tell the same kind of stories with the possibilities we have? Or should we reject that and say, look, no, no, no this is commercial, Disney, theme park, and you know, we stick to our stuff. It may mean that we only get different kind of audience and we don't have the same impact, but at least we can stand up upright and say, you know, this is what we can do and, and we believe in that. Um, and that's um, whether archaeology should be telling these stories is one side. Another side may be that archaeology is already telling these stories. Um, so much of the media reporting about archaeology is in these terms and it's also being facilitated by archaeologists whether they want it or not. Um, film teams are arriving in many archaeological sites routinely and um, they interview archaeologists and the message that comes across is maybe in many ways closer to the um, invented kind of past than to the actual academic ambitions. So in a, in a way, popular culture has already superseded this, this discussion, that it's, we are already part of this discourse whether we like it or not. Now the question whether we really should be doing that, whether well, this should be the explicit aim of archaeology just to do this, um, I want to leave that for a separate discussion really, because this gets us into a different field, what, 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 is, the, uh, what is the aim of archaeology? And you may have a number of different views, it, it's not only um, uh, conceivably about attracting attention and um, huge audiences. It could be, the, you may have very different kind of ambitions. Uh, ambitions. But I think what, what I would like to focus on at the end is, is, a, is another kind of question, the second question that follows on from this debate about archaeology in the past and popular culture. And that is it to, to understand in a bit more detail what is it that actually makes these stories so successful? Why is it that the Bosnian pyramid captures the imagination in a different way, in a much more um, profound way than some of the real archaeological sites? And I want to suggest three aspects that uh, they're maybe not the only ones, but they are three important um, aspects that a good archaeological story in popular culture today needs. Um, and that relates to the various examples of popular culture that I've given, and to some extent to real archaeology, but that's not the main focus. And the first one is that obviously a good story about the past and archaeology needs material clues. So you need something tangible to work with. Um, and that is precisely what the Boston pyramids are, you know. Now you've seen this image, you know, next time you come through there, you can no longer not see the pyramids. You know, it's right in front of your eyes, whether you like it or not. Um, Here's another example, you know, uh, okay, this is from a book, a children's book, David Macaulay, um, late 70s, called Gas Station. And it's an imagined future view of a, a contemporary uh, site. And it has become a ruin by then. And it's a, yeah, it uses some of the cliches of a particular kind uh, of drawings, which go back some 
um, some time. And that's not important. But the important is that, again, it's the material clue. You recognize this is a gas station. Um, and suddenly you understand that this is set in the future. And this is the, your own world that has aged. Uh, and you see it because it's there in front of you. You can look at the various details and, 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 and you understand um, the story of this um, particular site. Or you get this um, ruin, um, which is Wimpole Hall in, in um, the southeast of England. Um, and, well, there are many ruined sites like this. Um, of course, the particular quality of this site is that um, this is not a real um, ruin from the Middle Ages or anything. This is um, a Gothic folly, as, it, as it's known, uh, built in the mid-18th um, uh, century, um, uh, yeah, completed 1768. Um, so it's to the same extent uh, made up as the children's book illustration and, if you like, as the Bosnian pyramid. Um, and yet it has this, 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 we all can relate to that. We see oh, this is a ruin and it means something as a, sim as a symbol in our frame of reference of how we read ruins. Uh, we see a course of time um, having an impact on, on things uh, in terms of erosion and wear and tear and patina in some cases. Uh, you know, the, the vegetation on the children's book image um, is part of the patina that forms with time um, on artifacts and, and, and sites. Um, in the short abstract for this um, talk, I, I mentioned the term authenticity. How, how important is authenticity? And, um, well, and I'm just going to make this one reference on that, that the important thing to remember is that authenticity, I think, is, is not the precondition for a good story about the past, but it's the result of a good story about the past. <coughs> if the story is convincing, the site will be authentic in that sense. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to um, uh, cheat audiences. It can mean that, but it doesn't have to mean that. Uh, people can appreciate that something is a site of the past, even though they're now that it was built a few years ago. Like the Gothic folly doesn't really fool anybody for very long. Um, but you get a sense of what I call pastness there. Uh, and that's the same, it's, just, it's pastness that is the category that is important here, that is much more important than authenticity. Authenticity in the traditional sense is, based, is about age, how old something really is, and you can date it in different ways. Pastness is, is the quality of something being old, and that may have to do with age, but it may have also can be simulated in different ways. And this is what you see here. But here clues as one important aspect of um, pastness. And then of course you get the, the notion of material clues as significant even in the representation of the archaeologists, so not just the past. For example here uh, at Chessington, where you have this vehicle which has the archaeological tools in the back. Now this is all plastic, it can actually not be removed. This is, Everybody sees that this is not for actual use and it's not authentic and, and, and nothing. But it creates this sort of idea that here's an archaeologist on the go. And, and, and that's um, the idea they want to convey. And I say that archaeology is a verb uh, because it's always associated with tools and um, processes that involve you doing things. Archaeologist is the person who does things. You discover things, you find things, you study them, you analyze them, you preserve them. It's never about results. It's, archaeology is a verb in the sense that you're always on the way, on, on, the, on, on the go doing something. And it's that that makes it so appealing, uh, one aspect of what makes it so appealing in popular culture. And the um, material clues for that are, for example, here the spade and um, various other uh, objects, the lamp and some dynamite, I think, is there, and some petrol, so you can keep going in this Jeep and, and so on. This is all essential for the archaeologists to be on the go. The second aspect is um, what is required. Well, it's, it needs to, the story needs to co correspond with our expectations. It needs to match what we already know. Now, with the pyramids, of course, there's a question mark um, because we have never known that there were pyramids in Bosnia before. Um, so, on the other hand, you know, if you would look for the biggest and oldest pyramid in, in, in that place, you know, you would have it in front of your eyes, you know, because this is what a pyramid looks like. Uh, this is the shape you would expect. So, it's, it, it's both sides. It's, it's skepticism of the context, but also it actually does match our, um, the shape of the pyramid, at least if you look at it from this particular angle. <laughs> it's not quite as persuasive if you look at it from the angle. Um, but okay, this is the image. 
Um, again, here you see the, the adder shot at the, at the beginning, which matches our expectations in the way that everybody sees it's, an, it's a, an, a mosaic from antiquity. And of course, it doesn't in the detail they, uh, they use, to, which, which is the trick they use to, uh, to make their message about um, this particular um, drink. Um, and this is a site of a uh, uh, seemingly um, historic um, road, which is um, Main Street in Disneyland. Um, and of course, they do this very professionally. They know exactly which kind of story they want to evoke. And it's in partly based on Disney's own hometown. But it's not an exact copy by any means. But some of the features are, are, are based on that. And then they use certain proportions and so on to, in order to give the right impression. And what is important is a former senior Euro Disneyland manager from Paris, um, he stated in, in an interview something that, that, that makes exactly this point. He said, we are not trying to design what really existed in 1900. We are trying to design what people think they remember about what existed. So that's the difference. So that it's, no, it's not an attempt to create what the world was like 100 years ago. It's an attempt to create what people think they remember about what it was like. So they start with the audience. This is precisely what Neil Asherson also was saying. Let's talk to the audience first. What does it mean to you? And then relate to that. And now their ambition is to make people at home there. And archaeology may have different ambitions, but they could use the same technique to some extent. And, okay, you know, what profession does this guy have? Of course he's an archaeologist, because he corresponds with our expectations of what an archaeologist um, looks like. So here you get the second criteria in relation to archaeology. And the third point is that I think you need a um, credible, what I call a meta story, linking the past with the present. So uh, it's not good enough just to talk about what things were like in the, in, in the past or just to create something that matches our stereotypes. You also need to connect um, what you're dealing with, the object of study, with us um, today. Um, and this is really the, the problem of the Bosnian pyramids. That's where the controversy comes in. Because the academics will say, look, you know, um, this is not believable. There's nothing before the pyramids and nothing after the pyramids. You know, we just cannot, this does not match the story of Bosnian cultural history. There's nothing to fit this into. And on the other hand, this is precisely the argument why the Bosnians think it's great. Because they want to have a glorious past and be part of the uh, big cultural history of Europe, have the oldest pyramids in, in the world there. And it's precisely the big story that uh, is important to it's not the details whether this particular part of the pyramid has this age or that age, but it's a major feature of their cultural history. These are the kind of stories we're, we're used to in archaeology and prehistory. Um, human evolution um, or cultural evolution, this is a famous representation of the course of history with different sites and different people associated with different periods. Uh, and this is what we all learn in school books and, and in university degrees. And, and, and what it does is it puts everything in its place within this bigger story of evolution or cultural history or development or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm not sure if you remember that, but, um, and I'm not sure if you remember what the archaeologist uh, is called in that film. It's Dr. Cornelius in the um, Planet of the Apes. Um, and of course here they play with these conceptions because they, they turn this traditional development of human history on its head by uh, having a history starting <coughs> with people and ending with the apes. Um, and it's, it's all about, and, 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 and the joke comes, uh, the, you really, you come to this moment at the very end of the film when you find the ruin of the Statue of Liberty and suddenly it all falls into place. You see the ruin and the whole story makes sense. You understand everything and it's inverted to, to, to what you would expect. That's this idea of which they play with in this case of, of, of the, the long story that puts everything in its place. And again, in terms of archaeology, archaeology also has these meta stories that link uh, the past with the present. And maybe the most powerful one is the one of preservation and, and conservation today. That so much of archaeology is about rescue archaeology and about saving things from imminent destruction on behalf of whole of um, humanity. Uh, world heritage is the most extreme kind of cat category of that, managed by the um, UNESCO on behalf of the United Nations. Uh, and on a small scale, it's all the rescue projects, um, little everywhere. Um, and of course, much of the archaeological meta-narrative that we are used to is, is one of scientific progress. That we say, you know, this is only a small site, but it contributes to this big story of ever better understanding the past and the history of this region. And we get a much bigger and fuller picture um, at the end. 
And so this conservation story um, complements this particular story about scientific progress uh, today. And if I was working in, in Bosnia and um, would believe in the Bosnian pyramids, and I think the tip I would give to Semi Osmanajic is to take this on board and go now out with the story, not we found the biggest knowledge, but say the Bosnian pyramids are under threat. <laughs> what do we do um, to save this fantastic monument from imminent destruction by this, that, or the other, wh whatever it might be? I think that would give him a whole different kind of um, 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 fuel to run his story with. Um, but to my knowledge, he hasn't done that yet. So let me round up um, last um, two images. Um, here's a number of the examples we've, we, we, we've looked at um, today. And of course, many of them are commercial, and it's about commodification of the past and of archaeology. And I wanted to make two points about um, why I think um, this is more than just gaining the attention of journalists and uh, reaching a mass audience. And the first point was that it's uh, an asset for economic and social development, um, with the example of the Boston Pyramid. And the second point is expressed in this quote from Richard Maltby, and he says this, if it is the crime of popular culture that it has taken our dreams and packaged them and sold them back to us. It is also the achievement of popular culture that it has brought us more and more varied dreams than we could otherwise have known. So yes, it's commercial and it sells that back to us and some people make huge profits or not so huge profits as, as the case may be on, on these things. And to some extent you feel uncomfortable about that and you know, why should they exploit a common resource in, in that sense? But on the other hand, it also makes these common dreams for so many people real. People can buy into these narratives through commercial uh, products. For example, they can watch this uh, spot of Pepsi um, where, on whichever television station that was first uh, broadcast. An archaeological uh, documentary would not be shown uh, just before the news on the same channel because there's just not the economic muscles behind that. So it, it does reach a different audience. It does open up this sort of archaeo appeal and these dreams as Maltby take them to whole different audiences. And so this is um, one of the things, uh, one of these dreams is the dream of archaeology. And I think Osman Ajic, like here at the pyramids, when he has a guided tour with vast audiences, he opens up that dream to these people. You know, just imagine these pyramids here 40,000 years ago, whatever, 12,000 years ago. Um, and, and this is an aspect, this, this contributes to people's quality of life, you know, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's true or, or invented. They've been on, on their holiday, of the holiday of their lives, where they saw the discovery of Tutankhamun's grave, like, sort of, except it was the pyramids in, in Boston. And let me conclude um, with a song that um, sort of sums up much of what I've tried to say here in, um, in a different way. Sorry, I pressed, uh, I need to do this again. I pressed twice by mistake. 